All right, so this is the 17th lecture in this series on creating an international sustainable civilization. So this one is um, additional, the fourth or the fifth lecture related to this conference on ethics in action for sustainable development. Um, so the main point of this lecture is going to be specifically going through uh, some, a number of the sustainable development goals and showing how and why people should get together in this way and have these meetings and showing how it's a, it's a synchronistic effect. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. How by deliberating, we can come to unanimity and we can also set up like for education, we can set up a curriculum. And for in this one, we can set up a series of systems to help solve a number of these problems um, or address the sustainable development goals. So this is what happened. There was a convergence in 2015. And um, now the next, this is the what they were discussing. You know, this is this particular lecture focuses on, first of all, the environmental destruction that already exists and the consequences for human health. So the World Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And they go back to Aristotle, dating back to Aristotle, the good life of each person and the good society depend on this kind of multidimensional and interdependent understanding of health and well-being. And so later, later on, some of the later lectures I'll have is to show how greed uh, globally, the, the greed motive has led to a food system that's destroying our physical health, a uh, cultural system that's toxic and destroys our mental health. And then the social media, the iPhones, that also destroy our mental health and that destroy our relationships to other people, that separate people from each other, that undermine trust and well being. It's just the antithesis of what Aristotle thinks of as flourishing and his virtues and his. We are social and political beings by nature, and we're ripping that all apart. But that model of being rational is calculating the most efficient means to your own self-interest. You rip your family away from community. You move them here. You move them there because you got a better job. You use your money to sort of bribe your kids into thinking everything's fine. I mean... Business people who are gone 50% of the time from their families. What is this? I mean, it's so counterintuitive. Um, it just seems obvious to me that, that this is an inhumane way of creating a global economic system. And many, many books are being written at this point. But you can always go back to Aristotle and say, okay, Here's one definition of what humanity is and why it would be inhumane. So here's all the arguments. Um, but the most obvious things, things like air pollution, 90% of the people in the world are breathing unhealthy air. That's amazing. I went to Indonesia. I got sick from the air, and that's one reason I can't go back. I really, it when I go there after a month or two, I can't breathe anymore, or even it gets a shorter and shorter period of time at this point, and that's not good. Um, okay, so here are some examples. So some of the SDGs, the points, were uh, a consensus stopping modern slavery, stopping human tra trafficking, giving access to justice for the poor and vulnerable. And so when... The people got together, they they deliberated about um, what, what is working in their country. 
All right. So in one country, um, the cobalt supply chain that had child forced labor, pollution and poverty. So, you know, companies can go into these developing countries and if the politicians need the jobs or they get bribed, they can do pretty much whatever they want. So the UN can come in there or the government can come in there and, and end those human rights abuses, change it. And so apparently in this country, it was working. And so they came to the conference and provided a model that you could use. So here's a model for what we did to end the human rights abuses. And then other countries can learn from that model and take, use analogies. What's the analogy? And which aspects of their solution would work in my country? Um, then the Nordic model. So the Northern European countries have a model for combating prostitution and sex trafficking. The other countries, they might say, you know, well, our, this model won't work for us or it certainly won't work as well because the Nordic model has a whole lot of technology to um, enable people who are um, sex trafficked to have access to some sort of a hotline. I mean, whatever it would be, you, it'd be obvious to me that the level of technology, the level of flourishing and social networking in a Nordic country might be very different from an underdeveloped country in some other part of the world. But they can start out, they can get into a conversation, they can have a dialogue. That is there anything they're doing in the Nordic countries that actually they could connect technologically with developing countries? There's just a lot of ideas, a lot of possibilities that you really have to have people coming together and talking to each other, uh, explaining what they have to offer, uh, how to adapt uh, technology or uh, social institutions or leadership, somebody who would actually initiate the change somebody who wants to start a new institution, they need some government um, authority to do so. Just all the ways that in order to get something up and running or to get it running smoothly, it takes a lot of effort, but it really helps if you have other people to talk to. People who are ahead of you. You can imitate them. The Mexicans have a model of how to reintegrate the victims of human trafficking. So um, there was a, an editorial writer, Nicholas Kristof, um, and I used to read his articles quite a bit. And he found two girls in the developing world who had been trafficked. And he personally you know, made the effort to get them out of the situation. And the trouble is once they're out, if they go back to their village or they go back to their family, even they have, they're tainted. They can't get married. No one will marry them. And then can they get a job? Can they survive? Are their families humiliated? Do their families reject them or do their families embrace them and want to help them out? So for some of those girls, they probably have to, can't go back to their families. They have to have sort of houses where previously sex trafficked girls live together. They get jobs um, and they function in society. But one of the women that Nicholas Kristoff helped got into a fight with her mother and she headed right back to the, the woman who ran the prostitute house who was nicer to her. So she was okay with that. Um, so I think the Mexican model is probably that you make sure these, these young women or these girls get a good enough life right from the beginning so they don't run back, so they don't feel like their only real option is to go back. 
Another thing that I, I heard a talk when I was on the Fulbright and had a conference, and one of the women who had the Fulbright was helping with sex trafficking. And um, the girls said they really felt guilty about getting out of the situation because they were sending money home to their families. Their families depended on this money and they wanted to honor their families by trafficking themselves. So, so you have to find a way that these girls can make a living and send home just as much money. Now, sometimes those parents sent, you know, sold their daughters into sex trafficking and told them to send the money back. And then sometimes it's just the girls wanted to. So I would imagine that the Mexican model has accounted for all of these different nuances and variations, and they've come up with something that's workable, uh, that's successful. Then a new model for how to regulate organ donation and transplantation. And when you read this, you think, wow, there's many, lots of potential for corruption there. And then international justice, legal protection, and justice for the poor. So getting a lot of ideas about how to lift up the poor in every country um, and how one country will do it in a way that could be beneficial um, that another country could learn from. Justice for indigenous peoples is another important thing, which isn't just being nice to indigenous people, it's preserving knowledge that we really need. So indigenous people are humanity's frontline stewards of sustainable development. There's about 400 million indigenous people living in symbiosis with nature and they have a sense of responsibility toward the well-being in the environment. And they have organic links. There are organic links between the people, the communities, and the earth. And that's important. That's important knowledge for us to have. So there is a, a Harvard-trained economist, Vandava Shiva. And her big thing is earth democracy. She works in northeast India with farmers. And she really works on sustainable farming, keeping their seeds and replanting them. And um, so she wants, you know, that's her movement. That's what she wants the world to do. And she and Bill Gates do not get along because Bill Gates looks at the problem as an engineering problem. And he's in, he is much more in favor of genetically modified crops so that the fields will produce more food and then fertilizer and all of that. So my position on that personally is that why can't you have both? We don't have to cover the whole earth with uh, re-engineering in every square acre. And we also don't have, we don't have to do go back to sustainable farming in every square inch. So which areas of the world can, is it really feasible to do sustainable farming and do it in those areas, definitely. Um, and which ones really lend themselves more to the genetically modified and fertilizer? Um, where could you grow crops that you otherwise couldn't? because, you know, sort of mountainous terrain or terrain where you can't have a tractor or something like that. I mean, it would just be common sense. Um, so because we're destroying the earth at such a fast pace, um, maybe 55 years ago, we could have had a much larger um, amount of farmland that would work for sustainable farming. I don't know, but I think it's reasonable to think if you your goal is to maximize flourishing, you really have to constantly be making judgments and changing, being willing to change your mind on what would actually work. I mean, the other thing that I find annoying, which used to be a really big deal, 
and it still is a big deal, it's just not discussed, is birth control. Um, how do you minimize the number of the, you know, the birth or, um, number of young babies being born? So that problem is, I mean, the rate of births per woman is gone down, but still, I mean, we have almost three times as many people as when I was born. I mean, even though women are reproducing at a much lower rate, we still have way too many people. Almost every one of those people wants a higher standard of living that would use more carbon at this point. So Bill Gates, one of his projects is how to provide electricity that doesn't lead to carbon, that's actually sustainable because he's okay with everybody wanting electricity and everybody wanting a higher standard of living, but they can only do it if we can do it in a sustainable way. And so for him, that's an engineering project. Um, and I, you know, I'm not gonna disagree with that. Um, there's just always problems like, so we have lithium, now we need lithium for electric batteries. Why are we gonna run out of lithium? Or what about the conditions of work in lithium mines? Um, all the all the ways that people get bribed, that you have child labor, that you have pollution, that you have horrible working conditions, and just goes on and on. But um, I like the United Nations because it at least it holds it has the standards. It holds its it evaluates each country in terms of are they providing, given the resources they have. Are they using those to promote flourishing in their country? So they have, there's a model there, just like Aristotle. Aristotle is a model. The UN is a model. At this point, you know, they fit together. So I have written a lot on the United Nations Capabilities Development model. It came from Amartya Sen and um, Martha Nussbaum wrote about it in her book, Women and Human Development. I use that for no, a number of articles in terms of, and then when I went and visited in Turkey, they said that the UN will come out with a report every year, every so often about, based on the capabilities model, are people able to flourish? Are they given the opportunities? Because rights is pretty abstract. And so it's more like, can people actually eat? You know, you have a right to eat, but are people able to eat? You know, how much starvation is there? Is that the fault of the government? Is it, you know, who's at fault? Is it the weather? That's why we have to go sustainable. Um, but, but at least the UN is set up to make every country accountable and also to give every country a vote in the General Assembly. And there are a lot of flaws with the UN, but I think believing in it, developing it, constantly uh, making it better is a way better solution than trashing it or trying to replace it or uh, ignoring it. I mean, it really is a place to go. It's also a place where climate scientists work together in an international panel, which is really important. Their report is really important. Um, it's not it's not motivated politically the way that reports that come out from individual countries can be motivated and corrupted by politics and economics. So um, so, Anyway, the, the UN should be uh, a major player in this. And I got, I got to that because there's just disagreements about how much we should re-engineer the natural world, re-engineer you know, cultures, and how much should we try to go back to indigenous farming methods and bring people back into simpler communities, extended families. Um, and you need, you know, 
people coming together in organizations such as the UN or such as the Pontifical Academy so that they can get a sense of what's going on um, elsewhere other than just in their local, local area, their country, their continent. What can we learn from each other? So in a broader sense, like I've written about um, in Carl Jung, the animus and the anima, which is like yin and yang in um, Chinese philosophy, but it's about these two drives that we have, the nurturing drive, protecting what's vulnerable, um, you associate it with mothers taking care of their baby, and then the aggressive drive. And you can associate that with even a mother can become a mother bear if her babies are threatened. So we are a combination of vulnerable, nurturing, and loving creatures. We have these children that need our love for 15 years. So we, we should be very nuanced in um, our relationships to be able to relate to a kid, you know, throughout their life, as the relationship changes and grows, that requires an incredible amount of nuance. And of course, we always make mistakes. But on the other hand, we're very aware, consciously aware of our vulnerability. And so we can be aggressive. And sometimes that's necessary to survive, but we can also overreact. So this masculine feminine, which is Carl Jung's animus anima, is also connected to Aristotle's pleasure and fear. Because one of the main pleasures, of course, is sexual pleasure. But that's very different. That can be very aggressive. It doesn't, when it gets disconnected from reproduction and from raising children and becomes just a goal in itself to have um, aggressive sex, lust-based sex, that undermines societies. Um, and then aggression, when it really is triggered to survive and you really do need to fight back against aggression, unnecessary aggression, but it but that's fine. But when it becomes a goal in itself, so people admire each other for being able to be macho and being able to um, go into dangerous situations even when they really shouldn't be in those situations in the first place, then you start glorifying war and sentimentalizing war, and then you're really in trouble. And then when you make money off of war, or your children don't even have to go to war, that's trouble. And that we, we really have to take those different drives seriously. And we have to, I've read books where you have to really feminize in the traditional notion of uh, culture and civilization. Okay, so what about corruption? Uh, how do you define corruption? The abuse of power to preserve particular interests over the common good. So Aristotle says, uh, injustice is rule for the benefit of the rulers, right? You just use the power of the money you have to help your family and friends. Justice is rule for the sake of the ruled. So you use what you have to benefit others. By allowing the wealthy to avoid taxes, it prevents governments from investing in health, education, environment. It corrupts, the corruption undermines trust and social cohesion. It really is serious. I mean, all aspects of culture fall apart if you don't force the wealthy to pay taxes. That's again where Aristotle had especially inheritance taxes. Nobody should be born who will never have to work because they inherit money. They will never have to be connected to the culture, the people around them in any meaningful way. They're only connected to other rich people. This is a complete corrupting influence. And that's the kind of international culture we are creating. People are often trapped in corrupt systems. They're coaxed to adapt to the prevailing corrupt culture to survive. The corruption weakens democracy and leads to plutocracy, controlled by the rich. It undermines participation and political representation. 
because people don't have the time or the energy or whatever money it would take to get involved in political life. Corruption by rich countries undermines poor countries. Foreign investors from advanced countries are often part of the problem. They bribe foreign officials in order to gain access to the market. Once the bribe has been given, the public officials do not generally invest the proceeds of these crimes in their own countries. They transfer the funds overseas to financial institutions in advanced economies with the capacity to effectively conceal them, money laundering. So there are many advanced economies are criminalizing. So the response to that is for these advanced economies to make that a crime and then to, to be able to figure out who's doing it. But money laundering, all of that, um, we find out about that, the Panama Papers, the whatever. Every once in a while, we get this whole drove of information about where rich people have hidden their money. I think at one point it was in Cyprus, um, these remote remote islands or something. So the fact that the rich seem to have no interest in lifting up other people or in saving life on earth, I just, it's just shocking to me and it won't last. Like any year now, any time now, Somebody's going to figure out the best business investment is in green energy. If you really want to be stinking rich, you should go green. The other thing that Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and Elon Musk have got to figure out one of these moments, their kids are going to die too if we destroy life on earth, right? They have something invested in it, but right now they are just part of the plutocracy and they are unbelievably isolated and unaware and just not frightened by the problems, environmental issues. I do not know if you ask them face to face, do you think you will be affected by the climate crisis? Now, when it finally dawns on them, it's funny because it dawned on Bill Gates, I would say 30 years later than it dawned on me. Dawned on me in 1968. He didn't catch on until 2006, but all right, better late than never. Um, he is a model for somebody who switched and now he's really committed to zero carbon, negative carbon. I cannot figure out why these other zillionaires don't figure that out. And I keep thinking that one of these days they really will. And right now China is catching up and surpassing us. One of these days they might decide they don't really want China to take over. And the best way to do that is to go green and to um, invest in education so that uh, more people in the United States, more college students, whatever, can actually function in a STEM economy because the Chinese are very much into that. Like they're they're on board. Uh, we were the world superpower because we were ahead in the particular technological revolution of our day. We were the ones that I, that used fossil fuels and exploited the American frontier, you know, after throwing out a few Native Americans, of course. Um, it succeeded until it didn't, and it doesn't work anymore. So now we're in this transition point. And again, it, it's really exciting to have people at the UN having these meetings and coming together in the way the Greeks describe it, koinonia, they have a common mind. So if when people are friends at the highest level, they have a, a common mind, nous, koinonia. So the second half of the word is a common mind. And that's a common idea of the good. And I think we really can make 
huge um, leaps forward very quickly. So I'm excited about it, and I hope I hope people listening to this series of lectures also can get excited about what they can do to change the paradigm.